When I was a young guy, when I was about 13, 14, my form of a teenage rebellion was sort of lashing out at my dad and my family's wealth. My dad came from a working class background, but he was an entrepreneur, is an entrepreneur, and he set up a successful restaurant business. So me and my brother um, grew up in sort of relative privilege. And my kind of teenage rebellion was sort of almost throwing that back in his face and kind of saying, why is it fair that we have these flash cars in this big house when there's people sort of starving in the world? And that kind of attitude, which was, in hindsight, was quite harsh on my dad because I think the only reason he wanted to be a success was to provide uh, for his family. But that was sort of me as a teenager. So I went to uni and I studied politics and economics with a view to try and, you know, change the world in some way upon leaving. So I left university and I found that no one really wanted to give me a job, struggled in the sort of grad scheme interview processes and things. So I sort of felt pushed down an entrepreneurial path to set up my own business. So I decided to set up an events business. So the first event that I ever did was an event called the Festival Fashion Show, where I created a fashion show during the Edinburgh Festival. Now to put this in context, I was 21 years old and I was single. So I thought, this is a great way to sort of hang around with 10 beautiful models. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I would literally sort of, the date was set in, during, during the festival. So prior to it, I would literally, if I saw a really attractive girl in the street, I would go up to her and say, um, hi, I'm the, the organizer of the festival fashion show. Um, have you ever you know, considered modeling? Um, and you know, so I got 10 models together. I was thinking, this is fantastic. And I remember prior to the event we organized, uh, um, like a press shoot, and we, we got this fancy car dealership called Kenny Dunn's to sponsor the event. So I got Kenny to bring down an Aston Martin, and I had all the models there, um, and we, we got about five or six newspaper sort of paparazzi uh, shooting it. And I, I can sort of look back in that time and sort of pinpoint the exact moment when I really realized that entrepreneurship was for me, and it was pretty much this moment. <laughs> you know, it's a bit of a joke, but the festival fashion show, you know, it, wasn't, it was just something in my head. And that was the first time I experienced that something in my head became real. And that was a thrill. And I think I've become slightly addicted to that thrill. And ever since that moment, I've just kept pushing the boundaries slightly further and kept knocking on the doors a little bit harder and taking no for an answer less, less and less. And there's a direct sort of linear link between organizing that little fashion show in Edinburgh and creating this big event where we brought Bill Clinton um, to Scotland um, called the Scottish Business Awards. So from the fashion show, I started organizing other events and they got bigger and bigger. And I came up with this event called the Scottish Business Awards. And a lot of people sort of asked me, Josh, how did you get involved in the Scottish Business Awards? And if I'm honest, I have to sort of say to them, well, I created an event and I called it the Scottish Business Awards. Um, and I think because it was called the Scottish Business Awards, everyone sort of assumed it had been around for a long time and was very prestigious, um, which I think correct. <laughs> um, and it sort of became quite prestigious. It's ran for three years now. Um, and it's, it was the biggest business event by far in the UK in the last two years and the, one of the biggest business events ever in Scotland. The first year we organized the awards, um, we decided to raise money for, for charity, so we put together a charity auction. So I was trying to get some really big prizes for it, and the notion kind of came to my head to think maybe I could sort of ask if we could get a meeting with Bill Clinton that we could auction off in the, the, the charity auction. So I, w I sort of thought, right, I'll go about this. So I went on the Clinton Foundation website and clicked the contact page. Um, and it was one of those pages where there's not even an email address or a phone number, it's just a contact box. And so I sort of typed in that, organizing this big event. We had 800 business leaders confirmed to come. What would be the chances of getting a meeting with Bill Clinton to auction off? Send. I thought the chances of something coming back from that are, you know, borderline zero. So to my amazement, someone did email me back and they asked a few questions. And they said, okay, what we could give you is not a meeting with Bill Clinton, but a spend the day with Bill Clinton prize in New York. But the conditions are that you have to raise a minimum of £60,000 and you have to donate half of it to the Clinton Foundation. So I thought, well, there's nothing to lose. I don't know if that's realistic or achievable or, or what, but we had, had the prize, so we auctioned it off on the night. So it got to the kind of star prize in the auctioneer 
um, got, it, got it going, so it was 10, 15 grand, 20 grand, got up to 30,000 pounds, and there was a guy at the back of the room called Leo Coote from an oil company in Aberdeen who was at 30 grand, and he was pissed, pissed as a fart. Um, <laughs> So at that point, no one else was bidding. Um, the, you know, the auctioneer would say, we have to get to 60 or the, you know, the prize is not happening. Um, who's going to give me 35? And no one else was bidding. So I was thinking, oh, shit. But Leo Coote, you know, obviously had a few glasses of wine. The people around his table were sort of holding his hand up. So he sort of bid up on himself to 35 to 40, to 40 up, up, up to 60. Um, so it meant I could go back to the Clinton Foundation and said, 60 grand, there's your 30. Thanks very much. And a few months later, we were thinking, right, who can we get to speak? We got Bob Geldof to speak the first year. And we thought, who can we get to speak? So I thought, I'll get back in touch with that woman at the Clinton Foundation. So I got in touch and said, look, what would it take to bring Bill Clinton to Scotland to speak at, at this event? And she said, well, basically a massive donation to the Clinton Foundation. So I said, well, right, we bounced around a few numbers, and it came to the number of £210,000 donation to the Clinton Foundation. So I sort of thought, right, we've got, we can sell so many tables for such a price. Did a bit of math and thought just about cover that if we sell enough tables. So sort of full of beans, I was like, yeah, let's go for it. 210 grand. She says, well, it's not quite as simple as that. We can't just give you Bill Clinton's name to advertise on the vague hope that you'll pay us the money. We don't really know who you are. Um, so if you want to do it, you have to pay us 50 grand in two weeks, another 50 grand in a month, and the rest prior to the event. So at the time, I had pretty much zero money in the bank. Um, so I kind of thought, I thought, fuck it. Go for it. Um, so, so I signed the contract, um, sent it away. So I had two weeks to raise 50 grand. So basically, I phoned up anyone I knew with money. So the first phone calls was to my dad. Um, <laughs> so I said, you know that hard time I gave you about, you know, having money? You know, sorry about that. Can I have some of it, please? Um, so, so it was basically what I did. I phoned around anyone that was at the awards the previous year and said, look, here's the deal. We've got Bill Clinton confirmed, but... We have to raise 50 grand in two weeks. Will you take a table? And if so, will you pay me for it now? And enough people said yes, and we, we cleared the deposits, and, and it all happened. Um, so next, the, the year after, I thought, how can we follow that? And I thought, maybe we could look at getting Richard Branson. Um, it would be difficult, because he obviously lives in Necker. But you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And, it, and just a month ago, it happened. So what, a sort of powerful real, realization kind of dawned on me through this process that the world is completely malleable. You can create things and, and do things, and people will sort of buy into it, and you can kind of ch make changes. And that was a really powerful realization. So a few years ago, I came across a guy called Professor Muhammad Yunus when I was reading his books um, about an idea that he described as a social business. So he basically talked in his book about how in Bangladesh he's created over 50 companies, and some of them have gone on to become very large billion-dollar companies, but he's never owned a single share in one of them. Each company he's created has been to address a social problem. So I was reading his books, I thought, wow, what an inspiring idea. Um, and I was got this bug for sort of entrepreneurship, um, but it, it was slightly hollow just trying to set about to make money. So it really chimed with me the idea that you could be an entrepreneur and create a business, but you could do it for a purpose that chimed with me ever, ever since back when I was a teenager of trying to make a difference. So I invited Eunice to speak at an event we were doing, and it was very difficult to establish much meaningful communication with him. Um, so I ended up flying to Bangladesh, and I met him personally, and we spent a week there, me and my girlfriend Alice, where we toured around his different social businesses. Um, so that was me there. Um, and that experience has completely inspired us and changed the track of our, our lives completely. So we sold the, the events business, the, the main profitable event that we did, which was a ski and snowboard exhibition, um, for £40,000, and we ploughed all the money, plus any other money that we could get together, into opening a social business, which was a sandwich shop in Edinburgh called Social Bite, and we've got a little video just to tell you what Social Bite is all about. We are a sandwich shop. We compete with Press Amonji, Forget Express, Subway, and we are winning. But we are a sandwich shop with a difference. We are a social business. This means we give 100% of every single penny of the profits that we make are invested in different charities that we are passionate about. We support three different charities. We support Shelter Scotland, the Microloan Foundation in Malawi, and an eye care hospital in Bangladesh. Having only been open for a year and a half, we have so far funded 100 eye care operations in Bangladesh, 
funded 120 loans for women in Malawi to start their own business. And we have also made a significant contribution to Charter Scotland. With the help of the money we raised at the Scottish Business Awards last year, we have so far managed to open up four shops, two in Edinburgh, two in Glasgow, and a central production kitchen out in Livingston. At the moment, we're employing 26 people. What's really unique is that 12 of those people used to be homeless. I was homeless for 14 years. Then I got into the drop paid by selling the big issue. I mean, when you were out, selling the big issue in weather, rain, snow, whatever, you couldn't, you couldn't depend on it. The, the biggest thing in my life is I've got a job. When I first started, it was a bit apprehensive because I had to like, take methadone, I had to go to the chemist at the time, and I was basically said to me that we work for social bank, they'll help with drug problems and get my bank account and things like that, trying to get my passport. I first became homeless when I was 16. I met a girl, uh, went to live with her, had a child, got married, and then fell out with her and ended back on the street again. Never had any way to stay, unless it was on a friend's couch or under a bridge. I used to sell the big issue on the corner there, and that's where I met Jack, Josh and Alice, obviously. Before then, I was homeless for about six months, seven months. Then I met my mum and dad for the first time. Moved in with them. Well, I was homeless, I was selling the big issue in Edinburgh. I knew a couple of guys that were working for Social Bike. Josh said to me, would you like to come and distribute leaflets for the shop? And I started on the dishes, and he moved us up to the central kitchen here. Oh, well, it's a bit of a stable. It's stable now, it's got a, got a flat through here, through Josh and Alice, and it's brilliant. Every home first got a bad name for some reason. It's anyone come here with takes two wrong moves. You lose your job, you can't pay your mortgage, you end up in the street. So, it's an everyday situation that people don't realise. I've had the keys for the shop, but I thought I would never be able to get to close the shop up. To see a future here, a career, um, because this is the start of something big. Uh, they're already on to their third shop and the fourth one's coming within weeks, so well, I'm on to something big here. So. It's not just people like us that need it, that people come from other countries that have nowhere to stay. They know they can come in here and get a cup of tea, a sandwich, and they know there's money going out to the other countries, not just staying here. When, that's not right thing. I was really needing a full-time permanent job, eh? especially with my girlfriend, eh, I brought to give up. And ever since I've started with social work, my life's totally changed for the better. Eh? The ultimate ambition for Social Bite is to try and replicate what we've achieved here to create a large chain of sandwich shops to rival pret a manger or Subway, um, but do it completely for the social mission that we've established here. Thank you, thank you. The great thing about a social enterprise is that once you get the model right, we're not quite there yet, but if we can get the model right and it, get it sustainable and financially profitable, then all you have to do is replicate that and you can multiply the social impact very quickly. In the traditional sort of charity model, I might go to Gurdjit and say, Gurdjit, I've got a great idea um, to help the homeless. Can I have £10,000 to do it? And he might be a generous guy. Write me a check and give it. And then I'll go and spend it and do good work. Then I have to go back to him and say, um, and you said, what happened to the 10 grand I gave you? So I spent it, that's what non-profits do. Whereas with a, a, with a social business, you can frame it in a way where it's replicable, it's self-propelling. Um, so I want to finish with a quote from uh, Steve Jobs, the late Steve Jobs, which I think kind of sums up the message I want to try and get across, which is, when you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and your life is just to live your life and try not to bash into the walls too much. But that is a very limited life. Life can be much broader when you discover one simple fact, and that is that everything around you that you call life was made up by people that are no smarter than you. And you can change it, you can influence it, you can build your own things that other people can use. 
Shake off this erroneous notion that life is just there and you're just going to live in it versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Once you learn that, you will never be the same again. That's true. Thanks.